for many of the Kabbalists and like in the Zohar, understanding how God is one and participating in this oneness and unity is a big mystery. Mm. It's a mystical experience mm. because it's not about reaching some kind of transcendence beyond existence. It's reaching this unity in moments of intimacy with God and understanding that God somehow is one despite all of this you know, vocabulary that talks about different aspects and dynamic kind of uh, relationships inside God. Somehow there are moments in which he is one and somehow you can participate in that unity. Welcome, Adam Afterman. Thank you for joining us. Where's Thank Professor you, Afterman, Adam? Yeah, you could call me Adam. Adam works? Okay. Yeah, here at Hartman, we're less formal. Awesome. Fantastic. I am very excited to chat with you today because you have done some really fascinating, groundbreaking work in the study of Jewish mysticism Thank from you. a historical perspective. And I thought maybe we could focus on three core themes of your work that maybe tie something of a trilogy through your studies in mysticism. Mm -hmm. And those are Dveikut, Union Mystica, and Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit in some sense. Those words may be intimidating or unfamiliar mm -hmm. to the audience at this point, but hopefully by the time we're done, those words will be a much more clear and much more <laughs> understood. How does that sound? <laughs> that, yeah, that sounds good to me. I mean, okay. Yeah. So why don't you tell us how you began your research and how you got into studying the concept of Dveikut in Jewish mysticism and, and perhaps briefly what that concept means. Right. So, I mean, the Dvikut means a communion or conjunction or sometimes even union. There's some overlap uh, with uh, God. It's a fundamental, it's a key theme, idea, commandment in uh, Kabbalah and Jewish uh, mysticism. And uh, I actually wrote my uh, dissertation on this uh, concept under the guidance of Professor Moshe Idel at the Hebrew University. This was already uh, uh, a bit less than 20 years ago. Um, yeah, I mean, I was uh, drawn to this idea for many years. And what I was really interested in was to try to understand its roots. I mean, how did this fundamental idea develop and appear in Kabbalah and its background, both in medieval Jewish philosophy and theology and in earlier sources and rabbinic sources and, and in Torah? Because uh, the Kabbalah, you know, Kabbalah presents this as a key idea. But when you go to the earlier sources, it's something different. Hmm. So it's both recognizing that this is a key fundamental experience uh, and idea, at the same time trying to see its history and its sources. Would you tell us the story of Vekot? Can you trace out that story <laughs> from its earliest sources in the Bible right. down into Hasidot? Yeah, I know it's. I know it's no small. No I can small try to do that. I mean, I'm not sure if I can go now all the way to Hasidut, but I can just say a few words about this. Uh, you know, about the history of this concept. I mean, it really begins with uh, the Torah, with uh, Deuteronomy, in which we find a commandment uh, to cleave to God. I mean, uh, there are different ways, different uh, ways to understand what this means in the original biblical context. Um, is this a personal commandment? Is this a collective commandment? Is this a spiritual commandment, or is it? What does it actually mean? And when you go to Scott, when you you know ask the scholars of Bible today what that means, usually they would say that something it means a more collective commitment to God. It's part of a vocabulary that's talking about a collective commitment to God, and you can find also the commandment of love that's highly related to this commandment as as categories of commitment to mm. God. It's not about some spiritual, personal, intimate uh, relationship between man and God. But that's, that's a kind of uh, external perspective on the sources. An internal perspective would say, no, this is, uh, you know, the way the Kabbalists and other spiritualists read this sources much later in history is, no, these are key ideas, key commandments that are personal, and they are relating to the most important religious ideals that one can reach in his lifetime. That is love and communion, spiritual attachment to God. It seems like a lot of the work that you're doing is to distinguish between 
these way, the ways that we read the text through the lens of history, assuming certain presuppositions about what the text writing means, and trying to get back to something of an original meaning of the text to distinguish between, in this case, what Tvekut means in the biblical context for what it means in the Jewish context reading after thousands of years of Jewish mysticism. Yeah, it's, two, it's two things. One is to actually try to understand what it meant for you know, 13th century or 16th century Kabbalists as a classical, critical, mystical value. But at the same time, to, ch to see the, the sources in earlier uh, you know, texts uh, and the differences, if they exist, I'm not assuming necessarily that there's a difference. Um, you know, and not, and not against an assumption that what a Kabbalist in the 13th century says about the Vikud is actually the original meaning. But I want to investigate that. So if, maybe we start with the Kabbalah. What yes. do they think about the Vikud? Vikud yes. is a fundamental idea that man could reach some kind of spiritual attachment, contact with the light of God or with the spirit of God. So it assumes that God is uh, uh, available <laughs> for some kind of spiritual attachment or cleaving or fusion between his soul, body, mind, and God. And that's a fundamental idea. And that's reached as a, both as a kind of end goal and also as part of an ongoing uh, interaction and daily interaction with God. Uh, man reaches different levels and types of attachment with the uh, you know, divine body or divine organism. Uh, both for his mind, for his soul, for his body. So mm. it's something. It's both a kind of ideal, mystical ideal that's described through uh, imagery of light, of spirit, of sometimes even water. You know, being overflowed by the shefa, by overflow of the divine, and at the same time also a mean or an instrument in the daily interactions with uh, God. And now this is a this is an ideal that was then projected back into the vocabulary of the Bible and specifically into the commandment to cleave to God. Right. Just to get a bit of a sense of what the Kabbalists mean, perhaps, because these are very sort of poetic and abstract ideas to, to be bathed in the light of the divine or the yeah. energy or the water. What are some of the practices, perhaps, that the Kabbalists are engaging to reach the state of Dvekut that we can somehow make sense right. of today? So, I mean, the... the the, mo the most important uh, practice is the performance of the commandments and the study of the Torah. I mean, the Jewish life form, the rich halakhic life form is the most important practice or mystical technique, if you want, of reaching uh, dvikut. And how, how, the, the mitzvot, <clears throat> the commandments and the Torah are divine. So through engaging the commandments and engaging the Torah, the Torah, studying the Torah, with the right intention, with the right disposition, one can reach gradually to assimilate, assimilating with the light that's in these vessels. Hmm. So because the mitzvot are divine, they're the will of God in some sense, and the Torah is divine, the, the knowledge or wisdom of God, by enacting and participating with those divine forms, one is coming into some sort of contact and relationship with the divine itself. Right, but is it's an right? ontological connection. What does that mean? That means that there's a fusion. There's a, we're talking here ontological contact with the divine presence. It's like a sub substance, it's a divine substance that one cleaves to. That's the entire idea, that one cleaves through his spirit, through his mind, with this light or overflow or power. Right. So these are the metaphors being used by these Jewish mystics to describe yeah. what it means to come into some sort of real substantial interaction and contact right. with something. With God, right? Yeah. With God, not just not just a uh, observing of some sort of distant dictator's right. celestial command, but to actually participate in the in the substance of the life of divinity itself. Exactly. Yeah. And is that an experience which we, from their writings, can glean is having a psychological impact and change on the internal life of the mystic? Yeah, I mean, sometimes, in some cases, they do describe the experience of the Vikut. I mean, there's two different things. One is the Vikut as an ontological, ongoing process, and when one is cleaving to the light or the divine and reaching some kind of assimilation or participation in the divine life. And sometimes they talk about the experience, and they talk about the experience of being uh, overwhelmed or overflown by light or by overflow or by the divine name, 
there are different ways that they describe this participation or fusion with uh, the divine. Hmm. But yes, uh, the idea is that this is something, this is an experience that changes at the core, the human uh, being. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, the man reaching its ultimate, uh, you know, value and ultimate uh, experience. It's ultimate religious experience. One <laughs> reaching his true being. Man's true being is God. By cleaving to God, one reaches his true being, his true tselem, his true kind of essence. Hmm. And how is that change described? Um, they would use words of participation in God and man reaching his true essence as God. Hmm. So we have, this, we have this old notion that the man is both, the human is both matter and form. The, the idea of the human, so you're saying that the, the real idea of the human is, is divinity in, in some sense, is God. And yeah. striving to their perfect form is to strive to their divine form. Is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, so we were talking very abstract. It really, you know, there are many ways that they talk about this. Each Kabbalist would uh, emphasize a different aspect. But they all share this idea that this is the fundamental dynamics and the fundamental, uh, you know, end of religious life. Right. It's reaching this uh, right. cleaving, reaching this assimilation into God right. and this integration. This integration sometimes could be very short term just for, uh, you know, in, in time of prayer, one kind of cleaves to God's mind and through prayer. But it can also be an ongoing process for the soul. And sometimes they can describe it as something that's experienced and sometimes they can describe it as something that's more ontological that's happening on an ongoing basis through your day and day life in the commandments and the Torah. At the end, you reach this kind of cleaving, and it's not necessarily something, an experience, an ecstatic experience. Right, it's just the fact cleaving, of reality itself. Cleaving doesn't necessarily become ecstatic, but there are some of the Kabbalists that describe this cleaving through ecstatic categories. Got you, got you. Okay. This seems like quite a radical idea. For someone who's coming out of an ordinary religious monotheistic background, yeah. God is not something that we can ever really approach and certainly not unite with or cleave to. There's always seems to be an infinite distance between the divine and the human. Yeah. Where does this idea emerge for the Kabbalists and how do they come up with such a radical conception of the possibility. I don't think it's radical. They, they don't think it's radical. For them, they just don't share that uh, that idea that God is not accessible. For them, for they, they assume that God and man can participate mm. and can, uh, you know, the man can cleave to God and unite to God. What about all of the biblical sources that speak about God being beyond the human? You know, Isaiah who writes that my thoughts are beyond yours, just like the heaven is beyond earth, sort of this transcendence, yeah, so they, this distance They of interpret God. those sources differently, and they have plenty of other sources in which man and God share. They share soul, they share a mind, they even share some other qualities that are more corporal qualities. So, I mean, from that perspective, the idea, if they look back on the Jewish tradition, the notions that talk about God and man participating in various ways, is much more developed than the ideas that God and man are totally separate. Hmm. So they have much more material to support their ideas, obviously in a new interpretation, a new mystical interpretation, than the more philosophical idea that says that God must be totally and absolutely separate from man. Where do they, where do they get this idea from that that God and the human don't have to be fundamentally alienated and separated from one another. I think that's a Jewish, uh, personally, I think that's a Jewish idea. I mean, they read the Torah, they mean the, they read the biblical and rabbinic sources, and they see that man and God share and participate in many, many things. That what's new is a more, I would say, a neoplatonic or a philosophical kind of bridge that says that there's a, uh, spiritual bridge between man and God. God is spirit, man is spirit, God is light, man is light, that there's some kind of bridge that allows man and God to cleave, to touch each other on a spiritual level. And, and, that, and that's a big interpretation. That's a big jump. You see what I mean? But from the, the biblical into the from the biblical into the into the medieval Kabbalist right. interpretation. But they but generally this the if you look into the sources of the biblical or rabbinic sources, mm. 
they're not promoting the idea that God and man are absolutely separate. Let's pretend like I don't know the Bible and I don't know what Neoplatonism <laughs> is and do the work for us of taking us from a biblical conception of God as the Kabbalists are reading it, this participatory conception of God, this divine nearness and, and, and then tell me how that works its way through Neoplatonism, ancient and medieval into the thinking of the Kabbalists. <laughs> Okay, I can, I can try. I mean, it's it's a long story and uh, a very you know quite a complicated. I'll story. tell you why I'm asking that because yeah. I think that this idea to you is so obvious after having studied it for 20 years. <laughs> right. But for your average person out there, this is quite a radical idea still. And I'd like to I'd like to bring back a sense of wonderment and see what sort of watch that idea develop conceptually throughout history. Right. So uh, as it goes, I understand what you're asking. I mean, if you go to the if you read the Bible, you read the rabbinic sources. The idea is that although man and God participate in many different ways, you can't touch God, I mean, not a, neither physically or spiritually. That you can come close to God, you can see Him, you can hear Him. That there are features that are similar, but ultimately, God is not a substance that you can part. You can assimilate yourself into right and this is the big chidush this is a big the new idea that says that god or divinity or our godhead that some part of god is a spiritual substance overflowing to man and that man as a spiritual being as a mental being as as uh yeah as a spiritual a mystical being can somehow cleave attached to this spiritual, noetic, spiritual, mystical substance, which is God. And the metaphors are light and spirit. Could you give us... So that's, yeah. that's a major chidush. You have to understand, that's the chidush. So, so that's the innovation. That's the innovation here that we're talking about, right. that we can actually cleave to God as a spiritual substance. Can you give us some examples where from within the biblical text and rabbinic corpus they're getting these ideas? Because I, I think of biblical texts, for example, where God tells Moses that no human can see my face and survive. We think of distance as the, as the, as the metaphors. Where are they seeing these sources of, of closeness and participation? Okay. So first of all, the, there is different voices about in the Bible about the possibility or the invitation to see God or not. So it's true that we have a voice that says, denies that or says you can see God, but that's, that'll lead to your death. Or only when you're dead, you can see God. Right. But there are other uh, classic sources like Ezekiel chapter A, where presumably a prophet saw God, had a vision of God, hmm. right? Um, and we have the entire ancient Jewish mystical tradition that emphasizes the possibility, although very rare and risky, of seeing God. God, in principle, has uh, features that can be, you know, uh, a a topic of a vision hmm. or subject to a vision. But how is that? Isn't God infinite? Isn't God not made up of particular visible proportions? What kind of God are we speaking about here? A God that we can see? It's not a philosophical God and it's not a theological God. It's not a God that's gone through theological uh, analysis yet. So it's a more mythical God. That has a uh, has features that can be you know experienced hmm. uh, for sure. Is this kind of like a, a Greek god with like a, a big beard? And, no, it's and not a Greek god. It's a, it's it's a Hebrew god. The Hebrew god is a god that has many human features to it. But obviously, they're not talking about material features, not corporal features in the normal sense. But it's also not an abstract God in the normal sense. It's a religion that's not gone through systematic theology, did not incorporate philosophy yet in a serious way. At what way. point are we talking now? So we're talking about until the 10th century. Right. So rabbinic Judaism is non-philosophical, right. right. non-theological. So the way they talk about God is non-philosophical. And what are the aspects or components or elements of God that are appearing and being developed in rabbinic Judaism, which a person can observe or participate with or come into contact with? So his, uh, they talk about his measurements, his psychological measurements and behavior is something that we share hmm. and we can uh, study hmm. 
Um, and ex- to some extent, they also talk about uh, even having some kind of vision of God, although that's something that's extremely rare and dangerous. But they're not interested so much in seeing God, but understanding understanding that he is sharing the Jewish fate of the exile, for example, mm. that he's a psychological being, that he's angry, that he's sad, that he has all these features mm. that are biblical and they continue to exist in rabbinic uh, sources. There are initial uh, attempts in the rabbinic sources to try to understand God's psyche and to try to make sense a bit in a more systematic way, but it's not, it never reaches a very uh, systematic and theological uh, articulation at this stage. Got it. So we have, we have a God of the Bible who seems, as you're saying, to have pathos, to, to be angry at people and to be happy with people, seems to even have some sort of measurements, anthropomorphic elements. God sure. uh, has a hand that strikes Egypt and God, you know, these, these kinds of bodily almost descriptions, although you're saying that they're not being read corporeally in terms of a physical body, but uh, perhaps some... They're read as functions. Okay. Yeah. And what happens when, and, and, and behind this kind of we have what you're saying is a Jewish mystical tradition, which is reading the prophet Ezekiel, for example, that are developing these capacities and techniques to, to, to visualize God, to come into some sort of contact or experience with God. Right. What happens when those streams meet with Jewish philosophy in the 10th century? Right. So that's, that's a, this is a major dramatic meeting, encounter, um, in which the first thing that happens is that Judaism uh, rediscovers its own monotheism again. It realizes its monotheistic tradition through both Muslim and philosophical lens. Um, because philosophy now is encountered through Islam. And Islam has a strong emphasis on God's transcendence and uh, mon- you know monotheistic kind of insight that God is one that does not participate in nothing. Plus, meeting the idea of philosophical monotheist- monotheism that means that God, in order to be truly one, cannot participate in nothing. He cannot, he has to be static, he can't have any components, he can't have any dynamic, uh, there's nothing in him really. He has to be a, non, you know, a God without qualities or mm. attributes mm. in order to be truly one. Mm. So if you decide that the most important idea of religion is that God is one, and that's the foundation of your thinking, the price that you need to pay is that God must be beyond this world transcendent, non-participating neither with the corporal world or the metaphysical world. God has, has no positive attributes. He has no psyche. He has no attributes. He has no, uh, he doesn't have a mind. He has no processes of thinking or feeling that are happening inside this uh, being. Because if you talk about a process, if you talk about God as thinking or as feeling, or interacting or participating in anything in this world, you're undermining his absolute unity. Right, because now you're saying you have God and God's thinking or God right. and God's... So, so what happens with the philosophy is that for, in order to establish Judaism as monotheistic kind of religion, we had to, they had to go against the entire tradition that talks about God as participating with human existence. That seems like quite a dramatic moment, yeah. right? This encounter with a radical philosophical monotheism. It's not. I don't think it's radical. It's just, it's just you know, there's nothing radical about it. It's just, uh, you know, mythical monotheistic thinking. Right. Encountering. But you're saying it's a denial. Philosophy. It's a denial well, of the entire rabbinic mythical it's not, tradition. It's not. I don't think it's a denial. It's just a reinterpretation of this tradition in light of very strong philosophical insights right. and tools. Right. So how do we, what are some of the methods used to reinterpret a tradition which did attribute a lot of things to God with now a tradition which says nothing can be attributed to God? Right. So here you have a few different uh, uh, methods or solutions. Some of the solutions would say that everything, all of the language that we have, both in the Bible and the rabbinic sources, that are describing God, are actually describing not God, but describing a created uh, angel or created kind of metaphysical realm or something like that. 
trying to say, look, between us and God, there's some kind of mediating metaphysical realm that's, uh, that the language that was describing God was really describing this kind of realm. And that's one solution. Another, another solution is, no, uh, this is just metaphors. It's just metaphors. It's just a way of expressing, talking about God, but it's not actually describing anything mm. in God. Mm. And another a third strategy is to say all of these, all of these attempts to describe God as a participating in human uh, nature and somehow is just uh, inner uh, experiences or perceptions of the imagination mm. and have nothing to do with the objective with the divine reality. With divine reality. Yeah. Fascinating, fascinating. So, so just to recap those, the first is to say that the God of the Bible is not the real transcendent God in some sense. It's, it's some sort of intermediary realm or no, deity. No, uh, no, no, no. The, the, the solution is about language. The language that describes, you thought that was describing God mm. is not actually describing God. It's describing a mediating, created being that's not deity. So according to that solution, when the first verse in Genesis says, Bereshit vara Elohim et et aretz, that God created the heavens and earth in the beginning, they would say that that is not the the ultimate abstract. No, it is. That is actually the ultimate abstract God. Okay. But if you talk about God having, uh, you know, uh, psyche, mm. so that's depends. They, they would say if you've seen that God, that kavod, that glory, that glory is not actually God Himself. It's a created being. Interesting. So you're saying there are some instances some, where yeah. the, where the biblical text is read as referring to the ultimate God. Isn't there a Kabbalistic tradition which reads... But what I'm saying now is right. not Kabbalah. Right. I mean, I just right. want to make this right. short. This is the philosophy, some of the philosophical discourse before the Kabbalah. Right. I have, <laughs> maybe maybe this won't make it into the final edit, but I have a question just myself. Yeah. One of the terms that the Kabbalists use for this transcendent God is God is Ein Sof. Um, mm -hmm. and, and don't some Kabbalists distinguish between God is Ein Sof with Yotzeb Bereshit? And they would say that the God of Genesis 1-1 is not the Ein Sof? Yeah, they had some of them, yeah. Okay, so let's, we'll, we'll, we'll hold off. We won't get to the yeah, yeah, but this yet. is, look, I mean, the, we, we're going into a very complicated uh, discussion, but this is, good. En Malasot, I mean, it's a very complicated story. Good. Well, I think we're but, a good company for a complicated yeah, discussion. Okay. The, these Kabbalists, sorry, before the Kabbalists, so, these philosophers that are doing this work of using one of these three strategies to reinterpret biblical and rabbinic tradition to make it fit with this new found. Um, radical transcendence, this absolute unity, which you're saying they're getting from Greek sources and, and Islamic sources. Do those philosophers believe that the human can come into a dveikot, a union, right. a contact with right. the divine? That's, so that's an excellent question because at the same time that they're offering this new interpretation about God, and they're also reinterpreting uh, new these new religious ideals of love, and communion. Hmm. And here there are different ways, different, each one has a different interpretation. Love Some, and communion, you mean the biblical obligations the, to love, to love and, and, commun and commune with God. God. Now they're reinterpreting these, uh, these commandments now as fundamental and applying, some of them would apply to God. Nevertheless, despite the fact that God is transcendent, man can reach a personal and intimate connection with that God including the cleaving. I mean, that's a Neoplatonic, that's a critical Neoplatonic idea that we learned from the Neoplatonic tradition um, that, uh, by the way, might have Jewish sources. We can talk about yes, that maybe please. later with uh, Philo. But the idea is that nevertheless, this transcendent God, the God without qualities, right, can be a subject of intimate, direct cleaving and even union of man. So some philosophers right. would say that. Some philosophers would say that you can only reach some kind of love story with this God. But they're both, they're interpreting at the same time uh, some interpretations of cleaving and love with God. So to me, that sounds like a paradox mm -hmm. at best and a logical contradiction at worst. <laughs> How, and, and these people are sophisticated philosophers. Um, people like Isaac Israeli, Ibn Gabriel, these right. are the thinkers we're speaking of, I'm assuming. How do they how do they not see that as a contradiction or how do they work through that paradox of both a God that is beyond any description, beyond any contact, absolutely transcendent with no properties, and yet 
one with whom we can come into a substantial ontological, real relationship with and and participation. They just that's part that's part of the Neoplatonic tradition. Uh, you know, philosophy also developed over the years, not only Judaism. And the philosophical uh, Platonic tradition, the so-called Neoplatonic tradition, developed this idea that the human soul can return and climb back into the you know realms of existence that you know that are metaphysical, and even in, under some circumstances reach this union or cleaving to the to God or to the to the first uh, you know to the noose to the uh, collective uh, mind or or intellect that exists above, and and that's just that's part of this tradition, and and it's a mystery. I wouldn't say it's a paradox. It's more like a mystery, for in their eyes, it is a mystery how and that can happen. That's and they're seeing it as a mystery because to me it seems clearly like something that that seems to be difficult to be reconciled, something which is absolutely transcendent and yet something that you can be united with or come into communion with. Are they acknowledging that challenge. Yeah, I mean the Neoplatonic tradition uh, struggles with this uh, mystery. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's something obviously that they're struggling. But the, the the path of return, there are different stages. Your path, you you climb, you ascend first to the collective, you know, to the general soul, and then to the general intellect. A lot of the work is done with the general intellect. These uh, okay, these terms, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they may, they may be between <laughs> me and you, they may be familiar, but. Just outline for us very briefly the uh, the schema of the, the <laughs> Neoplatonic world, so you can understand what we're talking about. No, here. but this is look. I mean, when Jewish elite and starting in the 10th century onwards are encountering various trends of Neoplatonism, Arab uh, and Muslim Neoplatonism, they're encountering different syntheses that they were already done between the Neoplatonic tradition and religion with Islam. Right. So. And, but generally speaking, there's in this idea that God is a transcendent one or being that gives birth or emanates from out, inside of himself how, somehow. And this is beyond your comprehension because your comprehension can reach only the first emanation, and that's the intellect. Right. So out of God is like chokhmah, this divine wisdom. You know, it's a divine intellect that is emanated from God. And then from this intellect, there's a general soul that's emanated. And from that soul, we have, you know, and in giving a very simplistic kind yes, of yes. Uh, picture here, is the cosmos or nature or matter right. is emanated. But what's important here is that this idea is that ultimately from God, everything is emanated. And the path of return of man is to gradually... Uh, reorient himself back towards the higher realms of existence, uh, escape, if you want, this existence as a material uh, you know, being, and return to, first of all, to the news, to the general intellect, and ultimately even towards the one. Now, some of them emphasize the possibility to go back to God himself. Some of them would limit it to the intellect. Got gotcha. you. Right? So but in any case... Transcending the intellect towards God transcends intellect, transcends language, transcends categories of being. Also, mm. so it's a big mystery how to how man can transcend this uh, existence and go beyond that to, right. towards right. God. But that, if you open Plotinus, you know you can learn a lot about this mystery. So I, I see I'm asking you something <laughs> difficult now. I'm asking you to talk about something which cannot be spoken uh, right. in any in any which way. So. Just to make sure uh, I'm following and the audience is following, uh, God, the one, this this supreme um, entity or principle, which is being itself or beyond being sometimes, uh, emanates existence out of itself, uh, from itself, and that does it through a chain of emanations, you're saying beginning with with this intellect or, or consciousness or mind or some sort, uh, and through a process of emanations until we come to our world, our reality. And the human can... And should, according to the Neoplatonists, uh, follow that trace of emanation back up to its source as far as as far as they right. can go. So, so what you have here is uh, an understanding of transformation, of a path of perfection and transformation that now is considered as a religious path. I mean, now the the big interpretation, the big move is saying what we learn from Neoplatonism 
is actually the true meaning of the Torah, of right. the halachic way of life. And is that already being done by the Muslim Neoplatonists, turning that into a religious yeah, principle? They made the, some of them do this already with the religious path. But what's happening now is to say, look, religious life is about undergoing this path of transformation. Right. And this path of transformation has a very strong ideal of assimilation, of cleaving, because when you return to the intellect and towards God, you're not just returning and having a visual vision of that, you're assimilating into it because that, that's how it's structured. I'm not gonna go in, it's a very technical thing, but the, the way is that the intellect or the mind, when it returns to these realms, by experiencing the knowledge that's there, by knowing what's there, it also assimilates itself into it. Gotcha. So so what happens is when you're, when you're synthesizing Neoplatonism with Judaism, you're reintroducing a very developed idea of cleaving both to the intellect or to the metaphysical realms and God. And what the, the, the most important move then is to say this cleaving is not just a technical cleaving. It's a religious right. value that's projected back into the commandment to cleave to God and love God back from the Bible. Gotcha. So they did this very powerful synthesis of Platonism and Judaism. That succeeded. One of the fruits of this synthesis is the introduction of the value of Dvikut. I want to say again, it's not that the language of Dvikut didn't exist before. The language exists already in the Bible. Right. But the interpretation of this ideal in a kind of structure, an abstract structure of, you know, of Neoplatonic kind of structure, is a big uh, innovation of medieval Jewish theology before Kabbalah, and Kabbalah continues that. Right. So these Jewish medieval philosophers from the 10th, let's say, to the 12th, 13th century, managed to synthesize and marry their philosophical concept of returning to the one which they derive from their Neoplatonic sources with the Kabbalistic notion of Dvekut, turning their philosophical project into a religious project and turning the religious commandment into a philosophical imperative. Okay, yeah, that's, I mean, that's what happens when you synthesize some of the, the meaning. It's not that they just absorb the philosophical into the religious, but some of the religious values were also absorbed into the philosophical sure, path. So it's a very rich and complex and diverse right. uh, synthesis right. because it was done by very different people in very different ways. Right, and it's not just one philosopher you're saying. It's a, no, it's a, it's it's not, a collection of thinkers and each one doing it in their own right. unique and way. Right, and, and the Kabbalah, and early Kabbalah, 13th century Kabbalah, you see different authorities negotiating the different traditions because it's not only the Neoplatonic tradition, but you also have Maimonides, for right, example, right. that's different from them. Right, bringing and the Aristotelian side Aristotelian of things. Aristotelian thing. thing. Right. So, there, so you have a very complex right. uh, negotiation of different... People, they're not part of one movement. They're right. not part of one group or school. Right. Or school. Right. They're, they're, I, many of them are isolated, although they're reading each other, but there are many of them working independently and right. individually, right. negotiating their own kind of new old interpretation of right. Judaism. Right. So okay. I don't think we're going to get into the individual <laughs> nuances between okay. the Jewish Neoplatonists. We have to choose the level of complexity for yeah. the purposes of the conversation. But I, sh I will say that anyone who is interested in pursuing that precise point, should have a look at your research in Hebrew, in your work, on, in your Sefer on Dvei Kotz, right. and in English, in your work, and they should become one flesh on the languages of Union Mystica, where you go through each of the thinkers. Right, but the, the, the English book uh, grew out of the Hebrew book on Dvei Kotz, but then I, I focused on the language of unity. I mean, so that, and there's some difference. Not every, not every discussion of communion or Dvei Kotz leads to unity. That's my next question. Okay, union, yeah. Okay. What is the difference? between Dvekut, which you're translating now as communion, and Unio Mystica, which, what would the Hebrew term for that be? Achdut, uh, Ichud, with Ichud Misti, sometimes you use that term, Ichud Misti. So what would, so what would, so, the, what is the difference between communion and union, between Dvekut and Achdut? Sometimes there's no difference. I mean, sometimes they overlap. Uh, when a Kabbalist, usually it's a Kabbalist, but it's not only, when he chooses to use unitive language to describe this participation or integration into God, so then it's unitive. And sometimes they would talk about reaching full mystical union with God. And that's something that's developed very much in uh, the Jewish sources. So, I mean, sometimes Dvikud has its own kind of uh, semantic uh, 
uh, context because it's a it's a commandment. There's a commandment to cleave to God. The unit, the uh, the union, sometimes is part of that, mm. and sometimes it's just a way of qualifying and describing what happens to man when he encounters God and reaches usually at the the most extreme, mm. the most you know so-called radical uh, results of these dynamics of vikut sometimes will lead also to union with God. So, so union, my, in the English book about union, what I wanted to do uh, is to examine the way, the language of mystical union, to examine the ways Jewish theologians and mystics uh, and understand or describe those moments of union with God. Got you. So you're saying that sometimes those terms are used interchangeably, right. but when authors are being a bit more precise with the language, they'll use the languages of union mystica, of, of achdot, right. to describe the further reaches of dvikut. Sometimes, yes. Yeah. Sometimes they'll say that there's dvikut is a more dynamic, not absolute mm. moment, and union is a more absolute moment in which one reaches full dvikut. Dvikut, sometimes union is like, full dvikut or the final dvikut or dvikut after life or depends. Sometimes it's just an alternative set of images and language to dvikut. It sits, stands next to dvikut. Parallel. It's not mm -hmm. parallel to dvikut. It's not necessarily qualifying. I hear that. Dvikut. You've done some fascinating research uh, building on some pr scholars before you For sure, yeah. on the origins of this concept of the the potential or capacity or goal of uniting with God in the Western philosophical and religious tradition. Right. I'm speaking specifically about your essay, which then made it into the chapter of your of your English book, looking at the transference of this concept of union mystica from Philo, from Philo of Alexandria right. to Plotinus, the father of Neoplatonism right. um, or late antique. Right. So uh, usually when you okay. So usually when we talk about union mystica uh, as a a general term, not necessarily Jewish or Christian or Muslim, we're talking. Usually we go back to Plotinus, who talks about this mysterious capacity. He also describes himself. I mean, you know, this rare, extremely rare state in which the human soul can transcend the entire metaphysical kind of a hierarchy and unite with the absolute one, the Plato's one that's beyond everything. And this is usually when we talk about Unia Mystica, we go back to that, to that source in Plotinus who discusses that in much detail and with very interesting and powerful language. Right. Uh, and then, and his influence will see flow into Jewish, Christian, and yeah, Muslim. So Muslim first of all, the Christian, Muslim. and then Muslim, and then Jewish right. uh, traditions. And it's significant that in the Jewish tradition, the encounter with Neoplatonism is last. Gotcha. Uh, and we're in a tradition that's very developed already. I mm -hmm. mean, the rabbinic tradition exists already for hundreds of years before they encounter Neoplatonism. And that's it has significance to the ability of Jewish medieval authorities to rethink Judaism through the lens of Platonism or other forms of medieval philosophy and have the authority to reshape Judaism as a more philosophical tradition. Generally speaking, they didn't, didn't have, they did not have the authority because it was too late hmm. to reshape Judaism hmm. as a philosophical hmm. tradition hmm. and they failed. Hmm. But going back to Philo, Philo is a middle Platonist Jewish philosopher, which is, he's synthesizing, he's the first grand synthesis of Judaism with philosophy, a very ancient one. He's, right. he's Before Plotinus, just to be clear. Before Plotinus, yeah. yeah he's middle Platonism, before Neoplatonism. Right. He's a, a very deep philosopher that's studying Plato and other forms of Greek philosophy. And he's offering a grand, uh, amazing uh, reading of the Torah. Mm -hmm. The Greek Bible, the Septuagint, uh, yeah, in through Platonic and other uh, categories, mm -hmm. and some of his writing is uh, 
uh, aimed at Jewish audience and some of it is written to the, you know, Gentile uh, audience trying to explain to them, you know, Judaism and some of it is trying to explain to ourselves what Judaism is through Platonic uh, thinking. And it's, it's fascinating. I mean, this is a really interesting synthesis uh, that ultimately did not really uh, impact rabbinic Judaism. Right. Right. And did not really impact even medieval Jewish uh, right. philosophy, really. Um, yes. Uh, although we do see here and there evidence that, you know, that he was, at least some sources might have been known for to Jews and stuff. But, you know, we don't really have evidence. He's only known to the Christians. Why does he have such a poor reception in the Jewish audience? He was writing in Greek. Mm. And I think that with the destruction of the Greek, uh, the Jewish Hellenistic community in, in uh, Alexandria and generally the destruction of the Hellenistic kind of Judaism, this kind of form of Judaism just uh, died off. Gotcha. Uh, and I think that also the rabbis uh, might have made a conscious decision not to... You know, they were different than from Philo. Right. Although they were living, you know, at least some of them were living in a Greek environment, Hellenistic environment, there's a question to what extent were they really open right. to Greek culture and Greek philosophy. I mean, for sure, it's safe to say that they were not open to Greek philosophy like Philo. Right. They didn't offer a deep, profound reading of Judaism through Plato. Gotcha. Okay, they knew some ideas but they didn't really offer a deep right. synthesis but while so, he doesn't have a jewish well, audience he, he does, does have a jewish audience he does have yeah a jewish yes jewish audience but his own audience there it's not right. the I rabbi mean, historically i mean uh, no he reception. does have he does ah, he doesn't have a reception yeah not until 16th century okay he so while he doesn't have a jewish historical reception until <laughs> much later he does have a christian and greek reception right. tell so, us about that so mine i was reading i was what i wanted to do is see how he interpreted the commandment to cleave to god right and then i i found that he's offering a an understanding about uh of this cleaving in a mystical platonic manner hmm. so in which cleaving to god means to transcend this world and reach union with god hmm. And so my argument is that Philo is the first Platonic thinker to introduce this idea based on his interpretation of the commandment to cleave God. Mm. Uh, he's the first Greek thinker or the first philosopher to introduce this idea that you can actually unite with God. The idea that gave that the idea when you go to Plato, you don't have this idea explicitly articulated. You can actually unite with this God, with mm. the one. Mm. But for Philo, for the first time, it's possible to unite with this one because he reads in the Torah that you need to cleave to God and he interprets this cleaving in a spiritual way and in a mystical way that you have to transcend all the created world and reach God outside of this world and then unite with him. Right, right. And, so that's, yes. And I suspect that it's possible that might, he might have influenced the entire Platonic tradition, including Plotinus. Mm. So in a way, if, if, if it's true, this, you know, assumption or suggestion that he influenced Plotinus, so then we, and then Plotinus influenced back Jews that read back in the 10th century onwards, going back to the Bible and reading now the commandment to cleave to God through the lens of Plotinus. So it's in a way a kind of a, a circle mm. uh, <laughs> that's closed between Philo and uh, the Jewish Neoplatonist. So Much a thousand later, years later, thousand right? years later. That's yeah. that's really fascinating because the the common accepted wisdom is that you know Mystica begins with Plotinus, right? And what you're saying is no, it actually goes back some two three hundred years earlier to this Jewish thinker, right? Attempting to syncretize Platonism with the Bible, right? Which which I think is fascinating, not just as a historical curiosity, but it's fascinating precisely because of a later occurrence to jump another thousand years forward from the Middle Ages to, to recent scholarship, where Unio Mystica, and I, I hope you could tell us a bit about this, was seen as not existing at all in Jewish mysticism right. by, by the commonly accepted academic opinion. And when, what you're doing is you're saying not only does it exist as a now a, a whole 
you know, team of scholars are trying to make the case for, but that it actually has its potentially original source right. in a Jewish thinker in Philo of Alexandria. Right. So that, that that's correct. I mean, you're you know you're <laughs> you're presenting it. You know, that's what I'm, I'm saying. And like I said, I'm following here uh, a lot of work done by Moshe Idel and other scholars. But in previous generations, there were um, there was a kind of more theological a priori kind of understanding of Judaism that Jewish thinking uh, always, under all circumstances almost, would maintain a categorical difference between God the creator, the transcendent creator, and the creation. And in a way, for a Jewish mystic that's working inside this understanding, would you know, he has to understand or limit himself to a kind of more uh, limited form of returning to God. And here Sholem, Gershom Sholem, the, you know, the great scholar, thought that Vikut meant this kind of compromise mm. between the natural, you know, eros or desire to cleave to God, but also the fundamental Jewish insight that God is so different from us, so separate from us, that we cannot reach the full mystical union. So, and, and this is, is part of his, him and other uh, thinkers to try, trying to make some kind of distinction between Jewish mysticism and Christian mysticism. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. Because Christian mysticism has on the one hand, you know, uh, or you have this idea of incarnation, or you have an idea of pantheism. In both cases, there is some kind of full participation between God and the universe. And Jew Judaism is acting exactly between not accepting pantheism on one hand and not accepting incarnation on the other hand. That's our via negativa. That's our fundamental things that, that a Jew must reject. This was, so, the, this was, this the was their understanding. Right. So what that means for a mystic is when, although a mystic is striving to reach mystical union he can't reach mystical union because he's committed to his society to the fundamental ideas of his society if he breaks through and claims that he reached mystical union he's breaking through the society the social norms that in judaism make this distinction like if you have spinoza on the one hand or christianity on the other hand those are the two others that Jewish mysticism has to limit itself and not reach to that place. What it means for our, for Unia Mystica is, look, even if a mystic, a Jewish mystic, is talking about some kind of unitive experience, if you read it carefully enough, you can recognize that it's not an absolute mystical union in the way that Plotinus or other mystic Christian mystics were talking about it, because they had their own criteria where man is fully and absolutely assimilated into God and he loses all of his particular or any kind of a form of identity or consciousness, etc., etc. So what Shalom would say to you, look, first of all, we have this idea of dvikut, communion, that many times is not unitive, and that's a kind of Jewish version, milder form of Unio Mystica right. on the one hand, but even, and he, and he was, you know, he obviously knew also some of the sources that do use unitive vocabulary, but he'd say, if we examine these experiences using the Christian criteria of Unio Mystica, you'll see that it's not the same. Hmm. Uh, or there are very rare cases in which some mystics might reach Unio Mystica and they're more in the Christian mystical tradition, the way they talk about it. Right. And, 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 and I say, okay, from my point of view, all of this is not, you know, this is just theology. It's uh, theological discourse. It has, I'm interested in the sources and here I'm following other scholars, like as mentioned, Idel and also Wolfson and other scholars, you know, that are... Um, re-examined the Jewish tradition without this theological assumptions. Right. So how did the conventional wisdom around that question of the possibility of union in Jewish mysticism change? If you go back to, uh, I think that the most, it's even before you did, there were scholars already uh, working at the time, you know, of Sholem. They were questioning that. We can mention Tishbi. Uh, 
Gottlieb and other scholars, but they mentioned that very, you know, in a very kind of uh, footnote here, footnote there. But Idel's uh, classic uh, Kabbalah new perspectives, if you can, you know, that's the most important book that came out in 88. You can, there's a whole chapter that he dedicates one chapter to Dvikut and one chapter to Mystical Union. Mm -hmm. Now, m my scholarship is based on him, but also different from him in a way. Uh, about Mystical Union, his attempt in that chapter was, and he's just giving a few examples, because, and he continued writing about it in other chapter, in other publications, was to demonstrate that unitive mysticism exists you know, in various places in the Jewish mystical tradition. Hmm. And I think that he, he brought so many interesting examples that ultimately I think it's quite convincing, although there were debates and some people until now are still feeling like this is something that's not Jewish. Hmm. Somehow it's not Jewish. I, from my point of view, I think it's on the contrary. Not only that it's a Jewish idea, I think that when you read the sources without this bias, uh, you see that many Jewish mystics describe forms of union with God. And it's it's just not a problem. It's not an issue. I don't see many uh, Kabbalists that say, no, 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 we can't reach. Mm. I couldn't find evidence in the literature itself to demonstrate or to prove that mis Jewish mystics had this problem of talking about God and man as one. They don't have that problem at all. That's right. all. It's right. just, it's already, I think it's been demonstrated so many times already that it's just not, it's not a big deal. Right. And on the contrary, I think that it's a, that if you're a truly monotheistic tradition, uh, monotheistic tradition leads to monotheistic mi mysticism. Monotheistic mysticism ultimately is only mystica mm. because God is one. Man is striving towards God. Ultimately, to participate with God and become one of God is the ultimate religious experience. It's just, it just makes sense. There's no reason why would you want to separate them unless you're coming from a philosophical tradition or a tradition that's trying to make artificial distinctions between religions. Right, right. See? It's a it's a fascinating shift in the academic thinking in the, in the scholarly position, and it's a shift which not only affects internal study of Jewish mysticism but also affects the perception of Jewish mysticism by scholars of mysticism of other traditions or comparative scholars. Right. I remember reading a lot of Christian scholars of mysticism, sort of in the in the early century, where they assumed that Judaism in the comparative scheme of other world mystical traditions was somehow lesser than or not as developed right. complete because it never went all the way to union. Right. And this wasn't being done out of a place, a place of prejudice. It was simple. It was simply there. The texts were inaccessible to these Christian right. scholars and they were relying upon Shalom. And yeah. therefore they created this topography or topology of mysticism where, Jude where Jewish mysticism didn't quite make it all the way where Christianity right. or Islam or Hinduism went. And, and this new shifting um, has definitely changed that that story. And I think some I think maybe within the Jewish community itself, in some ways that the that academia seeps into broader public conception as well, there was a sense where Jewish mysticism wasn't all that. It didn't have the the full the full deal. Uh, and now we're seeing that that change move, I think, also from the academic world into other academic, comparative spaces and into the Jewish broader self-conception too. Right. I mean, it's very interesting this, what, how, do, how do even the scholars themselves, how do they receive and think, you know, things again through? Because, you know, Idel's uh, studies that are fundamental on this topic, you know, like in many other topics, were already published in 88. Right. So how many years is that? I mean, you know, we're talking about a generation already. Right. Uh, and they're both in English and Hebrew, and, and 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 still, I think you can see sometimes scholars, you know, in general mysticism or stuff, still not really uh, internalizing this hmm. uh, this insight. Right. Fascinating. And and but internally, I think that most people accept that now, but then it gets connect. 
this issue of Unia Mystica is also connected to another discussion of Idel that's fundamental. They're trying to determine between ecstatic Kabbalah and right. theosophical, theurgical kind of Kabbalah. And some people are questioning that distinction. And it, this idea of Unia Mystica gets kind of linked into that discussion. And it's a whole thing, you know, there's a whole thing, but I don't know today serious scholars that would come and say that we don't have in Jewish tradition unitive mysticism. Right, right. I don't, I don't know anyone today that talks about that. And I think that it's important for our generation when we have um, many uh, young uh, folks that are interested in what I would say the more universal and, you know, and I think that unitive mysticism is something that's universal, that's, that's provide, you know, talking about something that could be shared with other traditions, sometimes even Eastern traditions. Right. And, you know, here I think that this is important to, to know, although it's not very easy. It's not, the, these unitive moments are not discussed in a very uh, open way in the tradition. It's not like you can just easily find and open the sources, but they exist there. Right. So I think that's important. I know that, you know, talking with younger folks today, or not so young, it doesn't matter if they're younger or not, but I mean, you can see that people are interested, drawn to this idea. And right. I know you're also drawn to that. Right. So, right. I mean, that's why we're here. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> talking about unity. Yeah. Tell me, tell me briefly. So you're, you're a student of Moshe Del for many years. You did yeah. your dissertation under him. What did you do in your scholarship that pushed things further than he had done specifically in this work of Unu Mystica, which you've published on yourself. Right. So, I mean, um, first the Philo move. I mean, he asked, by the way, he also uh, had a, no, you know, a few comments about that. And uh, I followed him on that also. I just want to give him credit on that. I just continued the work and went into more details about it, really, and just investigated more detail. Right. You were looking from, I mean, I, I read your book and it was, it was one of the most exciting Thank days you. in my academic <laughs> really? reading wow. career. Uh, I remember I was in the wow. Gershon Shalom reading room and, yeah. I, and I, I had to start, I was texting all my friends and posting on my status that like you guys have to get your hands right. on this book right away. <laughs> what, what I really enjoyed about it is that you took this quite obscure, um, esoteric concept that as you're saying today has, is beginning to be understood as a for its for its potential, whether that's transformative or it's it's uh, being read in all kinds of modern ways, and we can speak about how Unio Mystica is being read in a modern context in a second. But what you did was you took that and you traced the way that it was actually discussed linguistically and semantically by Jewish thinkers, um, all the way from Philo all the way really up until Hasidut. Maybe this is a good moment to transition from our early discussion from the medieval Jewish Neoplatonic philosophers to the Kabbalists and ask what do the Kabbalists do with this concept of Dveikot and Unu Mystica that is new or different than their philosophical predecessors? What is the Chidush which you were tracing in your work and they should become one flesh? Right. So, I mean, for the, the Kabbalists already have a much more complex understanding of the Godhead. I mean, they're not dealing with a simple static transcendent God. They're talking about a Godhead. And they have different theories of this Godhead. And this Godhead is overflowing its own substance, its own power, which, although we might talk about this later, is also associated with the Holy Spirit. Right. So God is much more accessible now. The God or divinity is much more accessible because it's, it's overflowing itself. And it has different kind of uh, gates or facets or places you know as a metaphor that one can connect to mm. so it's more an organic understanding of god mm. uh, in which man can encounter this body or this light or this overflow in various ways for different purposes some of these purposes are uh, for man to participate in the inner life of god through ritual and prayer. Other moments are more personal moments in which a mystic reaches some kind of union of his thought with the divine thought. You know, it's, it's what, what happens is that the language of Dvikut and union is, is more diverse. It's happening in different contexts. 
and and it's happening on a more daily basis mm. linked to the performance of ritual and the Torah, the study of the Torah. Although there's another, um, there's another trend of Kabbalah that's more ecstatic. The ecstatic Kabbalah, you know, Abulafia and other ecstatic mystics who are emphasizing reaching the Vikut and Unio Mystica as the ultimate uh, goal of religious life. And they're, and they're also introducing techniques that are not only for the mitzvot. I mean, they use, they talk about the mitzvot, but they're also introducing, uh, you know, techniques of letter permutations and using divine names, etc., etc., as powerful techniques that are uh, designed to reach one reach Vikut and Unio Mystica here in this immediately now. Mm. So, I mean, we're talking about various forms of cleaving and uniting with God for various purposes. Right. What the Kabbalists are doing, from what I'm hearing, is that they're introducing a much richer, dynamic, complex, organic concept of God, uh, as opposed to a philosophically abstract principle. Um, would it be fair to say that the, that part of the Kabbalistic innovation is also that the human can affect the divine? Yeah. Um, can 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 bring some sort of redemption, salvation, unity to the divine itself. Um, and is that something which is missing in in the in the Platonist and Jewish Neoplatonists? Yeah, I mean this idea that man, you know, I mean, first of all, they assume that there's the channels between man and divine are open all the time in different ways, hmm. and that man and God participate in various ways and also impact each other in various ways. Right. This idea of impact that actually does exist to some extent in the Neoplatonic tradition, but in a different way. Uh, but generally, when you go to Jewish philosophers, the idea that you can impact God is, you know, obviously it would seem to them as an absurd. I mean, you know, God is ecstatic. I mean, static, beyond this world, there's no way you can impact right. God. He can't change. He can't be impacted even by himself. Right. Um, but yeah, here there's an idea that in a way, either as, or as a collective, the Jewish people as a collective performing the rituals, the Torah, or individually even, powerful individuals, can impact the inner life of the Godhead mm. and also participate in dynamics of union and unity that are part, taking part inside the divine. Fascinating. So, so their unity becomes an intra-divine process yeah. as opposed to something. Why, why does the Kabbalists want to affect God? Like, what, what is so much, what's wrong with God that God needs to be affected or fixed? Look, I mean, this idea, you could take it to a more technical, mechanical kind of interpretation. I prefer, I think if you look at the way some of them, you know, if you look at the czar, for example, it's more participating. Mm. It's not so much, it's he's like a, you know, machine that you press this button. And I mean, there are, there are sources that describe that a bit more that way. But many of the sources are talking about participation because... The Jewish collective is projected uh, and on high as a feminine pers person of the God, right. persona of the right. God, the Shekhinah. the Shekhinah. So it's whatever you do, you are, there's a part of the Jewish people that's living inside God right. and it's the feminine part of God. And there's a whole relationship between God and this person right. or this persona. Right. So, and so you're impacting God because you're part of God. Right. So that's fascinating. So, and that this unity, this unity, this is the whole mystery of the one, of the unity of the one in the Zohar, where they talk about where there's moments, especially on Shabbat, that's the, the time of union, of mystical union in the Zohar is Shabbat. Right. In which this Israel as a collective is absorbed into the divine mm. and they participate in this mystery of the union, the inner union of God. Mm. Now, this unity is not a singular dot or, you know, transcendent dot that exists beyond being and beyond everything. This union is a mystery mm. that's experienced here as a participation in this uh, divine uh, unity between the God and the Shekhinah. I'll just put it, I'll just give you another... I mean, the difference. But one of the differences between the secret of the of the unity of the philosophers and Kabbalists is, for philosophers like Maimonides, the divine unity is a fundamental insight that he thinks that any human being 
can reach mm. just by thinking logically that God is one, therefore transcendent mm -hmm. of all corporal and metaphysical categories mm. of existence. Mm -hmm. For many of the Kabbalists and like in the Zohar, understanding how God is one and participating in this oneness and unity is a big mystery. Mm. It's a mystical experience mm. because it's not about reaching some kind of transcendence beyond existence. It's reaching this unity in moments of intimacy with God and understanding that God somehow is one despite all of this you know, vocabulary that talks about different aspects and dynamic kind of... Uh, relationships inside God, somehow there are moments in which he is one and somehow you can participate in that unity. And you can experience that unity. You can experience it, yeah. You can experience it on Shabbat through this overflow. This this uh, oneness of God flows down onto the human, on humans through the Holy Spirit. It's like this unity is also projected onto the, onto the people. It's interesting that... It's interesting that you're speaking about unity, but you're still talking about unity from God to existence or to the human, still two different things, as opposed to speaking about experiencing the unity in existence itself. I'm not sure if I, if I would make that distinction. I mean, there's no existence besides God. Right. So in, the, in, this, in these kind of forms of thought. Right. So, so I mean... So how would you separate those two? So then you're saying that when God is being united, it is reality itself that is coming into a state of unity with yeah, itself. That is reality, yeah. Hmm. You know, you have to read the book. I mean, I try to investigate some of these dynamics and forms of Jewish unity or union. You see, Jewish union is much more corporal, collective, and ritual, right. designed for right. ritual than what one would imagine of someone doing meditation and you know going out of this universe to some right. transcendent right. singular right. you know dot. Right, escaping as escaping. a... Escaping, although that also exists. Right. That also exists in our tradition, but we're talking about other forms right. Right. of <laughs> unity that are sometimes <laughs> counterintuitive. Right. As you're saying, as opposed to what Plotinus would call the flight of the alone to the alone, we have a bit of a different picture here. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to try and get into the mind of the Kabbalist to the best of our ability here. When they are projecting their collective soul, the soul of the, uh, the Knesset Yisrael, as they may call it, the Shechina, the Divine Feminine, um, into the, the, the Divine Drama that goes into exile when they are in exile, we have this as you're saying, this participation of the individual and the collective in the divine narrative, that they themselves are an aspect of the divine, experiencing the divine self-alienation, the, the, the separation of, of true reality from reality itself, in some sense. And in these moments of mystical union on Shabbat, or through the fulfillment of mitzvot, or through acts of, of gemil chasadim, of, of kindness to, to strangers and fellows, they're able to somehow bring reality back back to itself, bring God back, bring the feminine back to the masculine. Right. Um, and, and they're painting these, these sort of national and, and, and global dramas that they're enacting with their behavior. Is that right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's quite a rich imagination. It's quite a, it's quite a transcendence um, from the way that we would ordinarily imagine our lives we, in, on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's a very delicate kind of line between, you know, a very strong sense of uh, vulnerability and weakness and destruction mm -hmm. of galut, of mm -hmm. exile, to a, a sense of uh, empowerment, of, you know, godless, of being, you know, uh, in a very high level of impact, you know, and here it really depends on the mm. psychology or, you know, the persona of the people. Different different folks have different uh, emphasis. Some of them are more, you know, just participating with the suffering of the mm. Shekinah mm. and have a very strong sense of the exile. That uh, You find that a lot after the destruction of the, you know, of the exile of uh, Spanish, you know, Galutba uh, Sfarad. 1492. Yeah. 
Um, but that also exists before. I mean, right. it's not. It it really depends a bit on the on the personal feeling of some of these writers. Some of them are more. They they feel that despite of the exile, despite of the destruction, despite of the of the non ideal, you know, uh, state of the Jewish people, nevertheless. Through the Torah, through the commandments, through the Jewish way of life itself, which is identified also ontologically with God and the Shekhinah, one can reach these moments of intimacy that from out that they're not they're not open, they're not exposed to the external eyes. You see, an external observer would not recognize that this is a moment of unity. So, if an external eye would look at Shabbat. And from outside, obviously, there you know people Jews are living differently on that day, but you wouldn't recognize that that this is a moment. This is a day of reaching, participating in the secret of the one of God, participating in the unity of God, and it's not so much about generating that unity; it's participating in the unity in a way, not making sure not to destruct it. Hmm. You know, this is a very delicate thing. Do you do we generate this unity? Hmm. Are we just participating in it or we have to be very careful not to disrupt it or destruct it or, you know, inf- influence it in a, ba- in a negative mm, way? Mm, mm. Oh, fascinating. You see, so it's, it's very, it's, it's, but it's there. I mean, it, so then, so then unity can be experienced through the, through embodiment and there's no contradiction between corporal or physical existence and mystical union. And that's a big, you know, that's a contradiction in terms for many scholars of mysticism or Christian mysticism that say, you know, no, unity, in order to reach unity, you have to transcend everything. And that's like, we have that, that's Philo. Hmm. We have that in Philo, we have that in other kind of more platonic kind of thinkers in our tradition. Hmm. But there's a whole other... Uh, brand or trend in our tradition that talk about union that could be reached through the body, mm. through the eros, through uh, in, in, halachic behavior in this world, uh, without this uh, attempt to fly out or you know like like you said going individually or personally out of this world. Mm. Is there one example of of a Jewish mystic who's uh, prescribing or describing? This form of what you're saying and this embodied um, union with the divine—is there one example that jumps to your head as an illustrative? No, I mean example? the Zohar. I think that the Zohar is the most uh, interesting. Uh, it's, it's not an individual. Right. I don't know. You know, it might be an individual, but it's right. most likely uh, more collective kind of. Uh, right. give, can you give us an example of an instance in the Zohar where you see that embodied? Yeah, I see. I see that um, <clears throat> that on Shabbat. I, the whole secret of Shabbat is a secret of mystical union. Mystical union. Yeah. Okay. And it, but it's a it's a Zoharic Jewish form of mystical union that reach is reached in body. Right. On Shabbat we don't leave our bodies. Right. The bodies are the bodies and everything else are in a higher plane of frequency. existence or frequency, right. if you want more spiritual frequency, but. Union is reached in the body and through that, the meal. That's why there's a strong emphasis on the meals, right? On mystical eating, right? And even on uh, sexual intercourse. All of these things are part of one partial that say that participating in the secret of one of God is something that can be done through our on Shabbat. It's reached on Shabbat through your physical embodied existence. Fascinating. So s- precisely those things... I just, that's an example. Right. Yeah. Precisely those things that other mystical um, traditions that are emphasizing asceticism, escaping the body, fasting, ab- um, celibacy, it's precisely the opposite of that, where it's through the act of eating, through the act of sexuality, where one comes into a state of union with God. Right. I mean, it's... Some of them will emphasize similar ideas, and some of them will emphasize, look, it's not about... Not eating, it's about eating in a proper way with the right intention. You right. see what I mean? Right. So, right. Right. or all of these things are Bringing usually. Mind and body into alignment and that activity. Right. right. If one is cleaving, if yeah, one understands what eating is on, Sh- on Shabbat, the secret of eating on its various meanings on Shabbat is done in the, the proper attention, then 
Union Mystica, mystical union in the Jewish, the Zoharic understanding of it could be achieved. Hmm. What, in very brief, what is the secret of eating <laughs> according to the Zohar? Yeah, so you, so the secret eating is a, a topic I also wrote a, a bit about. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very important uh, uh, topic. There's a fascinating book by Professor Joel Hecker that I can uh, recommend that talks about eating in classic 13th century Kabbalah, including the Zohar. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's in English. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's highly recommended. I mean... Here, eating is a is a form uh, of cleaving hmm. because eating on its higher levels is not about consuming, you know, physical food. It's about consuming. It's a metaphor for cleaving to the light because me, eating on its spiritual level, mystical level, is actually eating light, okay, mystical light, and that is about cleaving to the light. So, I mean, but that's not what right. they say on Shabbat. When you're eating on Shabbat, you are in a, in, you're participating with the divine at your table. There is, the divine is presence at your table. Mm -hmm. And the food is a higher substance of what you imagine. Right. It's a bit like the mana. I mean, it's a, right, right. It's a bit lower than the mana. Right. If we translate that into modern parlance, <laughs> could we say that when we're eating, we're not focusing on sort of the, the material texture, but we're focusing on the sustenance, the nutrients, the energy? Yeah. I mean, they, their assumption is that what we call food right. is real, materialized light. Is materialized light. Yeah. And and light means energy, light. means life force. Life of God, light right. of God. Right. It's food is divinity, materialized divinity. Huh. So if you understand what you're eating right. and you're doing it on the, you, you're eating on the proper intentions, so you're actually cleaving to the light. You're consuming light. It's true that when you're consuming, you know, fish or bread or something like that. It appears as if it's something that's not light, mm. but it's actually light that's been, you know, materialized. Fascinating. All so that's so light. that's so that's a kind of form of uh, another form of consuming light. Fascinating. Cleaving Consum to the light. I mean, this is this we could talk about this right. uh, <laughs> we can, a lot. I mean. Maybe maybe we'll come to the um, the final uh, the final trifecta of this triptych um, picture of Jewish mysticism. The uh, the final category of the Holy Trinity, which is Ruach Hakodesh, <laughs> which is the Divine Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Right. Where does which is your most recent work that you've published on? Where does yeah. what? Firstly, what is Ruach Hakodesh in Jewish mysticism, and what role does it play in relationship to all these categories which we've been discussing here in detail? Right. So I mean, <laughs> I'll try. I'll try uh, to deal with this. I mean, this is uh, another key term that has a very rich uh, and complex interpretation for the Jewish mystics. And it has a unique history also. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is always... So, I mean, I'll, I'll say a few things about the Kabbalists first, and then we can go back and say what it means in earlier sources. Mm -hmm. But first, I would say first that uh, it's a very important Jewish concept. The Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, is a very important Jewish uh, concept, both for Kabbalists and philosophers, and even uh, before. So that should be known. I mean, that sometimes we, we are unaware of it. For various reasons, uh, its history of this concept in Judaism is not being investigated, possibly because of, uh, you know, many scholars being uh, sensitive. Is this like Christianity? Not like Christianity. And, and the whole discussion about the Holy Spirit in Judaism has this kind of baggage right. of the Christianity background or is it not background? Is it a reaction to Christianity? Right. Uh, polemic? not polemic, etc. And it's, right. it's a topic, any discussion at any stage of this concept is always taking that into account. Yeah. And there are, there are scholars, there are mystics, there are philosophers that are reflective about that and are taking into account Christian and Muslim hmm. concepts of the Holy Spirit. And some of them are doing it maybe uh, implicitly, some of them are talking about it explicitly, so it's there all the time. Got it. But just going back, talking about what the Kabbalists talk about, I mean, this this is back going back to the idea that divinity is overflowing. Yeah. So they use one of the metaphors they use, or one of the terms they use to describe uh, 
the overflowing quality of God is using the term Ruach HaKodesh. So if you'd go back to the rabbis and, and look at the term Ruach HaKodesh in rabbinic sources, it has two meanings. One is the major meaning that most of us relate to it in the Jewish tradition is prophecy or sub-prophecy, some kind of form, some kind of mechanism of delivering God's word to a prophet. Right, some or sort of to divine inspiration. Divine inspiration, and it has already a duplicate kind of thing where it's both a high-level form of prophecy and also sub, a low-level, right. sub-divine, sub-prophetic kind right. of form of okay. revelation. And that's <clears throat> most sources, most of the discussions are rabbinic classic sources related to that. Another meaning is uh, much more rare is associated with the Shekhinah, with divine presence. Mm. But that's not really developed. Mm. Now what's new in the Kabbalah is that they use this term now not only as a mechanism that's delivering God's word, but it's also delivering God's being. Mm. And that's the second category. Uh, yeah, this is the presence. second, right. So it's taking two of these meanings together. Right. So now the Ruach HaKodesh is the, is the overflow of God's being right. to man. And when they are, when a person, when a mystic is enveloped or is receiving the Holy Spirit, it's not only that he's receiving a revelation or God's word or, or some message, kind of right, message. Right, right. He's actually have receiving God Himself hmm. entering or embodying or enveloping or whatever you want to say into his being, into his body. Fascinating. So this again is part of this understanding of fusion and this is uh, uh, and many of the kabbalists talk about receiving the holy spirit as a form of integration many times receiving the holy spirit is the second phase of a mystical integration with god mm. it starts by man returning to god cleaving to god integrating at least partially back into the organic god mm -hmm. and then once you're part of this divine kind of body Naturally, then you receive the flow of the divine because that's what happens. The divine is overflowing inside itself, first of all, to its own vessels. Right. And once man becomes part of this mechanism, he receives this flow. Now, one of the outcomes, one of the outcomes of this flow is also receiving the Holy Spirit as a form of revelation. Okay. But this is only part of the story. The other part is that this overflow is entering into man and completing the process of cleaving, hmm. of fusion, of hmm. mystical fusion. And hmm. that has a deep impact on man. Hmm. You see, it's not that I'll say, okay, God had a message to a man and he trans, you know, sent the Holy Spirit, gave him the message, and then the Holy Spirit went home, right. you know, right. as a kind of metaphor. No, the Holy Spirit now is dwelling in the man, hmm. and this man now is, is having some kind of fusion with God. Hmm. And he's sanctified by that. Mm. His body is changed. His being is changed mm. as encounter, because of this encounter with the divine spirit. So the individual who receives the Holy Spirit in this, in this way that the Kabbalists are understanding it is not just the recipient of some sort of message, right. some sort of Morse code from God, but, but is actually receiving God. God, God's self into their being. Right. What does that do? What is, how does that change? How does that transform the individual Who's the recipient of, it's, of it's, the Again, it's, it's the same mystical idea of fusion with God. Mm. It's just completing the process of having this integration with right. God. Is that something which is happening in, in sort of erratic moments of ecstasy and sublime experience? Or is that something which becomes a plateau that the mystic lives in that presence of, of So divinity. you have both. You have both. You have some of the uh, Kabbalists that talk about this as a more natural outcome of living in the Dvikut. More one is living in Dvikut, then he receives the, the Holy Spirit. And it's a mystical Holy Spirit uh, that, that sanctifies him and allows the divine to live in him. And he then has access to all of the divine knowledge. Mm. That, but that's not ex necessarily ecstatic. Mm. And, but then there are other uh, mystics or Kabbalists who describe very intense moments in which one receives the Holy Spirit as ecstatic moments that are mystical experiences. Right, right. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because the Kabbalists are already identifying uh, 
God's word with God's self, right? So the Torah becomes the sort of the, the literary manifestation of God, of God's wisdom or God, God's self. So therefore receiving God's word and God's message and receiving God's presence, the boundaries between those are already blurred in some sense, right. where the message is the being of God itself, where right. the prophet or the mystic who has this divine revelation automatically channels the, the will of reality from God's perspective. Right, but it, it's it's even more than challenging. It's challenging. It's it's becoming God. Mm. It's a form. It's another form of cleaving and uniting with God. It's right. just th this time instead of the encounter happening in God, the encountering is happening inside man. Right. Right. So you know, just saying generally, if vikut many times is which somehow man meets God in God's place. Now God's meeting man in his place in I his see, body. I hear. I hear. So we, you started off the discussion of, of this Ruch HaKodesh category of this Holy Spirit, talking about its relationship, differentiation, confusion, overlapping with Islam and but primarily Christianity. Yeah. When we hear terms like the human becoming God, right, it's very difficult to not think of Christian categories like the divine incarnation or, the, or, right. or, or categories like apotheosis where the human becomes God. Mm -hmm. How... How are, the mystics, how are the Jewish mystics dealing with that? Are they are they embracing these categories? Are they rejecting them? Are they different? No, they don't use those categories. They don't. You don't find incarnation in that way. I mean, you won't find the word incarnation or apotheosis in Jewish sources, but scholars use them. Right. Sometimes there's you know sometimes there's criticism about using these. Uh, you know, there's a famous kind of uh, uh, you know issue about. Uh, using the term incarnation right. because um, some scholars say that incarnation is a very specific term that comes from a very specific tradition right. and it has a whole baggage to it. Right. It's very, very specific. Right. But other scholars would say, no, if we want to talk about, you know, um, in embodiment of the divine in your body, in the flesh, right. even in the flesh, right. sometimes they talk right. about it. in your body, and the flesh and we want to understand this process truly it's actually beneficial to use the word incarnation because the entire incarnational tradition grew out of a very similar tradition it's, right. it's from that now they're not only not separating christianity and judaism the same they're coming from the same from a very similar place right. we're from similar uh questions similar right. challenges right. So then it's not so terrible to actually, it might be very beneficial even to use the word incarnation uh, in order to talk about overlapping right. or the similar right. dynamics. Right. So, you know, there's very famous uh, debates now between uh, scholars in the field, you know, between uh, Elit Wolfson and Shaul Magid and Edel, you know, there's been a whole uh, controversy about this. Um, and... I would say that the word embodiment, I mean, it really depends how you define the terms. Right. If you understand embodiment, not in, a, in, not in a full way, so maybe you should understand the word incarnation. But if you understand incarnation as a Christian term with all the suffering mm. and all the sacrifice mm. and all this baggage, so then it's not instrumental because right. usually you're not going to have that. They're not talking about a specific, you know, uh, the incarnation of Christ. Right. We're talking about the incarnation of people that are not Christ, and it's not one person. It's right. many people, and they're not talking about suffering. Right. They're not talking about sacrifice. Right. They're not talking about many, many other items that are connected to that right. term. See, so it's a, it's a whole topic that needs a separate, uh, yeah. <laughs> a separate discussion. <laughs> but um, again, I think that the Holy, the Holy Spirit is a critical term in our mystical tradition, by the way, also in the philosophical tradition, that for reasons that are not fully clear to me yet, was almost totally ignored mm. uh, by scholars. Mm. So that's been, uh, been a great challenge for me to investigate. Unlike the, the work I did on Vikut and Unio Mystica, where I was lucky enough to follow you know, a lot of work that's done by others, here, it's been a much deeper or larger challenge to really go back to the sources, you know, even Maimonides and Nachmanides and 
going back to the Zohar and other classic sources and just trying to say, okay, what are they saying? What is what yeah. is the meaning of this term there? Yeah. yeah. I I'm very glad that you're that you're doing that work because when <laughs> whenever, <laughs> yeah. whenever I do read your scholarship, it's it's always it's always terrifying the 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 intimacy with the text themselves and with the scholarship and 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 the, the real sort of grip and deep dive and the the, the capacity to, to bring it into its broader historical narrative and I very Thank much you. appreciate, I appreciate reading your scholarship. You're, very, you're too kind. Too kind. <laughs> I want to I want to maybe ask one final question and with that you've been very kind and generous with your time. With that we can we can wrap things up. I want to I want to shift maybe perspectives from history that we've been speaking here, sort of scholarship to to theology if we can in some sense because we are speaking here in the under the roof of the Shalom Hartman Institute yeah. who are hosting this series and part of the work here is is also about asking questions of relevance in theology and asking those in a context that applies both to Jews living today um, here in Israel and Jews living in relationship with their Muslim and Christian neighbors both here in Israel and globally so I want to I want to perhaps see if we can turn gears and sometimes theology and psychology mm -hmm. <laughs> there's 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 blurred lines between them all of this this whole metric that we've been laying out here this this trinity as we've said of of dveikot unity mystica rocha kodesh which we've understood now to be part of one large uh, matrix that's all sort of one that's part right. of one continuum an organic interrelated concept we've we've had a really wonderful time going through the history of it and, and what it's meant at its different stages of development and how that's happened. What might it mean today to a, to a person who is Jewish or not, who is looking to, to develop in their lives uh, in a spiritual direction, to, to bring meaning into their life, to bring more unity into their life, whether it's for someone that has an active concept of God or that's no longer an active concept, how might these ideas be made practical or realized in the 21st century for a modern person, if, if at all possible. Right. I mean, I think that from all of those, you know, I think there's a difference for, for what's relevant for a Jew today and then, you know, what's relevant for the general audience. I think for Jews, uh, the fact that, you know, opening up these sources and, and showing this mechanism is uh, it's important. Like you said on yourself, also about yourself, reading this, you know, this stuff and finding that these things exist in our tradition is highly relevant for you today. And you know, you're not coming from, you're not a scholar per se, you're not coming from an academic per se, you're interested also in a personal theological journey. And I think that that's very important. That's part of what I'm trying to do is identify these most important kind of ideas or concepts and open them up. First of all, for myself, this is a personal journey for myself. It's not like it's clear to me. And now everything's clear, and now I have to just write a book because I'm a professor at the university. No, these ideas, I, I write the books or the papers in order to understand for myself, first of all. What are these un basic ideas? What is our tradition yeah. all about? Yeah. And I think that that is relevant for sure for any uh, Jew that's interested in his tradition. Saying that, I think that the idea of unimistica, like you mentioned... Today, for many of us in our tradition that are looking for um, some, some universal um, aspect to our tradition. I mean, we're all drawn also to the particular and the concrete realms of our tradition. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we're also interested in this idea of unity and union. Many of us are exposed to Eastern traditions. You know, if you go to also to the work of, uh, for example, the theology of Art Green, mm -hmm. my, my dear friend and mentor and teacher, uh, and, you know, it's different. What he's talking about is different, but it's all related to, I mean, you know, these ideas can feed in to a more, um, I would say, universal, right. mystical understanding. There's a tension that exists inside our tradition between the particular and universal. Right. And this could be a part of that story. You're saying unity between the world's religions and mystical traditions. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think that it's important for Jews today to know or have this understanding that, that there's some understanding of union and unity inside our tradition. Right. right. Because that allows us, the assumption is that this God that we're uniting with 
is ultimately a universal God. Right. You right. see what I mean? Now, right. now that's a very interesting right. assumption. Right. I, I know ultimately I think it is. It is the case. It is, is the case. I mean, the same God that we are uniting with is the same God that Christians and Muslims and any other uh, person on this globe is uniting with. Right. And But that doesn't undermine the whole particular, you know, the idea that God is identified with the Torah and the right. Jewish people. Right. But right. If, you balance, if you have this right balance between that aspect of our tradition with this idea of... Uh, that it is through this particular tradition you can reach uh, to a universal, transcendent, it's in a way transcendent or not, transcending the particular. Right, right, right. Okay? Through the particular. So, yeah. so that's one, that's a very beautiful point. I'm glad you said that, that through coming to to recognize these, these concepts within our own tradition, we can enter into a global conversation about right. uniting with some entity, which, or, or, or whatever we want to call it, that, that unites all of us humans. Yeah. And I appreciate that that conceptual point. On a, on a practical point, though, what might it mean, if anything, for a modern person to come into a state of union with God, whether that's Dvekot or Yunu Mystica or Ruch HaKodesh, when we no longer are operating with the metaphysics of the Middle Ages? What 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 might that mean, if anything, today, in a, in a practical sense, in a realized right. sense? I mean, that that's an excellent question, and. You know, for our modern times, you can read many of these sources, especially the more mythical ones like the Zohar that I mentioned before, or the more poetic ones. And you can see that, the, you know, that you don't have to, you can kind of take take away the ladder. We don't have the ladder, the metaphysical ladder anymore, but the ideals still exist. Mm. And I think that you can still, I, I mean, you can still um, relate to these kinds of ideas, what even are the if ideas? you have yeah. the idea is that, for example, God is a being that you can have an intimate connection, even though they were in a post, uh, you know, Kantianian kind of time. You can love God. I mean, this there's a lot of there's a lot of work being done by Jewish thinkers to think through these ideas of love, intimacy, even communion or union, even in our post. You know, in this modern time where we don't have these bridges anymore, ontological right. ladders and bridges and stuff. Right. But in many ways, Jewish mystics were not that interested really in, many of them were not that interested in these ladders all the time and stuff. They were, they were interested in uh, jumping over the lap, jumping this leap and reaching communion with God or union with God without ladders and bridges and stuff like that so in a way it's still a lot of it's still relevant mm. today mm. and as as active citizens in a cosmopolitan global modern democratic world how does how might coming into that consciousness of union change our behavior change our interaction change the way that we see people or the world around yeah, us if you really if you really think through what monotheism really is that there's one god so you really understand that there's one humanity and that's a critical, critical point. Right. One God means one humanity. And now we have in our tradition the idea that we're the chosen people, that we have a unique relationship with God, that God, that the Jews, Jewish people as a collective is part of the Godhead and stuff like that. All these ideas can be interpreted in the right way and balanced through this idea that God is one and humanity is one. And if humanity is one, we have absolute responsibility to each other. First of all, all these ideas of supremacy and stuff like that have to be, you know, uh, thought through and understood in the right way. And I think that's one of the challenges that we have as scholars of Jewish mysticism now. And work has been done by, uh, Eli I can mention Eliot Wolfson and other, you know, important scholars thinking at our, looking at our tradition honestly and saying we have a very strong, part you know, tradition of of, uh, of particular relationship between God and the Jewish people. But we also have a universal tradition. And we have to find the right balance. And, and in any case, understand that when Jews were talking about this particular relationship, they were not talking about supremacy. Mm. There's a huge difference, a categorical, absolute difference between talking about particular kind of relationship between God and the Jewish people than talking about supremacy. Right. And that has to be balanced out through this idea that God is one. Humanity is one, 
And there's an entire realm in our tradition that deals and accepts that. And that's a, that's a, that's a tension, that's a balance that a person have to, has to exist. Balance. Now, that's why if I go back to the Tsar, when they're talking about uh, Shabbat is the most particular time in the Jewish calendar. It's the mm -hmm. time, it's the intimate time of the Jewish people of God. Right. And it has nothing to do with the other people. Right. But at the same time, it's also the time where we're celebrating the creation of the universe. Right. And it's a time in which we reach this unity with God. Right. So you can reach the unity through the particular, you know, and you can balance the particular through the unity. So if you ask me what the big challenge is for our generation now is finding the right balance between the universal and particular and in investigating that in our mystical tradition, mm. because the mystical tradition has the most radical and deep ideas about this relationship. Yes. And many people can misinterpret these ideas into very, you know, supreme supremacy, racism, and all these kind of terrible interpretations because they don't have the right balance between the particular and the universal in our tradition. Wonderful. I think we're just in the right place <laughs> to bring this conversation to an end and we're in the right place to be exploring these questions of universalism and particularism. Right. This is part of what we're doing here at the Shalom Hartman where I'm, you know, I'm very proud to be a, a fellow here for the last 20 years. You know, I kind of grew as a scholar here over the years. I arrived here when I was an MA student <laughs> <laughs> and I studied the various programs and uh, now I'm a senior fellow here. And I think that this one of our, uh, you know, goals here at the Machon, at the Shalom Hartman, is to really face our tradition honestly <coughs> and to, you know, investigate, for example, this uh, tension between the particular interpretations of our tradition. Yes. So, you know, that's yes. something we, we have to do here, hopefully in the next few years. It sounds to me like important work and holy work mm -hmm. and crucial work. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm very glad to, to have been a fly on the wall with an observer <laughs> for it. Um, I'm just wondering, is there, any, is there any final words, any last message to people that are out there on their journey exploring, trying to get into Jewish mysticism, which is not always an easy subject right. in, in both, in either in scholarly ways or in practical ways? Any, any final thoughts, any takeaway? Yeah, I think that the most important thing to remember is how diverse this tradition is. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you start learning even a, a specific literature, and each one is a huge, like the Tsar. So there's great translation, you know, the Pritzker uh, translation of the Tsar. Um, that's an amazing project that can bring you into the Tsar. But the Tsar is just one universe inside a large universe. So you have to, you have to kind of, the best way to really learn this tradition is to learn various forms and literatures and, and get a dive in, and try to get a, a sense of the diversity that exists in this tradition. Because if you only go into one kind of line of tradition, you get a distorted kind of understanding of our tradition. Right, right. And then you superimpose that on everything else. <laughs> right, right. But that, but that's a, that, that's a big challenge. I mean, to do that, you really have to, uh, you know, study and learn. It's a vast tradition. Right, right. Well, right. thank you for inviting us into that study and for sharing <laughs> your you. user thank study you with us. Thank you for the invitation, really. It's been a very lovely conversation. Thank you, Tzvi. Thank you.